This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. The Yom Kippur War saw thousands of Israelis lose their lives, but it didn't have to happen that way. Through firsthand experience in the NSA, Bruce Brill reveals the shameful truth that members of American intelligence agencies knew what was happening, yet deliberately misled the Israeli government. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. So what would you do if you had information that could literally save lives? You share that information with those who could do something about it and then watch them deliberately ignore what you just told them. That's exactly what happened to Bruce Brill when he was working for the NSA during the Yom Kippur War and it bothered him for so many years that he wrote a book about it and you'll never guess what the Pentagon said about that book. Well, David Robinson, Angie Clark and I are going to talk about that in just a second, but first, it is official. The barley is Aviv, so we are on the first Shabbat of the month, on the month of the Aviv, (laughs) on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. Now. Let's talk deep state with David Robinson. Yay, <laughs> we, made it. Yay. we made it through that complicated introduction there. Uh, uh, but, brother. <laughs> you got to fill us in. Well, you know that that calendar name is so long; it's just you forget where you are sometimes. Yeah, we could thank Michael Rue for that, huh? We could, yes, yes. The, long, the calendar with the longest name in the history of the world. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> but anyway, yes, it, the Barley's of Eve. So we're we're into a new moon month. So uh, we have Passover coming up here in just a couple of weeks. So yeah, that two is, weeks. Wow, gosh, yeah. two weeks. Can you believe it? It's I can. Fast. My body says, hey. It's, it's, <laughs> Passover, it's Passover time. That's right. Absolutely. Now, speaking of Bruce Brill, Angie, before uh, we started here, you said you know how we got in contact yes, with Bruce yes. Brill. So tell us the story. An old friend of Michael Rude's is a friend of mine. Her name is Renee Kropik. And her and Bruce had hooked up again uh, from old friends. And she said, hey, she said, I've got Bruce Brill here. Do you think that uh, Mike would want to visit with him? And so that's how it all came together. It's oh, like wow. old friends met up like from 20 years ago. And uh, that's how Bruce came on the show. That's so Michael fun. said, absolutely. So. And we had Bruce here on uh, Zoom mm-hmm. from Israel. And we set up, uh, when we were doing that, just as we were getting set up, we actually had a monitor set up in the back of the studio and Michael was back there with a microphone and then we just, we, they visited for a while oh, over Zoom while that, we were getting that was things so ready. Sweet. So I love so, that. Wow. And then Michael stuck around for the uh, episode and actually corrected us on a couple of things where Bruce couldn't remember, but Michael could. Of course. Yeah. So, <laughs> of so course. Here you say, Bruce, remember this? Oh yeah, and then we talked about that <laughs> <laughs> later in the episode. So it's good to have Michael here because he remembers things that nobody else does. So exactly. Beautiful thing. All right, speaking of beautiful, okay, this thing here only has a little while left, about a week left. This is our love gift for uh, for March. Mm-hmm. And this is a bowl that when you look at it on the screen, I thought it was glass or acrylic or something. Yeah. It's metal. It's, it's metal. Beautiful. Yeah. And David, Handcra- you- handcrafted in Israel. Really? Okay, yes. So this is hand painted, I guess. Mm-hmm. Huh? Hand painted, yeah. And then we have the mezuzah that's made out of uh, olive wood for, in Israel. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we were talking before, and you have to scroll in the back, of course. But uh, the company that that uh, we get this product from actually helps people who are making aliyah to Israel. So I they employ that. these journey people and uh, and help them out, you know, because it's really difficult when people aliyah to Israel and if they don't know someone to find a job, to find Destitute. work and so forth, yeah. yeah. So uh, this ministry is a really good ministry, helping these oh, wow. people out. So it's a beautiful piece. So that's and what our partners are sewing into. When that's right, doing. exactly. You get the love gift, exactly. you're doing that donate. very thing. Not only are you yeah. helping us, you're helping us help others, so. Wow, that's beautiful, wonderful. And uh, so, Passover's coming up. We can't forget about that, right? Just a couple weeks. So uh, we have all kinds of folks coming into the studio here, but people can still uh, sign up for online. Sign up online. online. There's the information on the bottom of your screen right there, and you can uh, sign up to watch. We've got... It's what it's a see, loaded. Keeps like it's something keeps going. I got to remember everybody here. Okay, so we've got Dr. Miles Jones mm-hmm. do the doctors first, and then we got Dr. Uh, Nehemia Garden, 
Uh, I'll be there as well, mm -hmm. uh, doing Matthew something. Vanderels. Matthew Vanderels. Matthew Vanderels, and we got uh, who else? Oh, our uh, Keith Johnson. Keith Johnson. Nelson Calvillo, uh, who is uh, who's the one actually helping Nehemia uh, do a lot of his stuff, mm -hmm. and. Then, we, of course, we have Michael Rood. The one yes. and only. Michael Rood's gonna be here. Uh, he's actually in the studio with us today, and I know he's excited. Uh, he's already camped out for Passover several weeks in advance. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. He's got his campfire back. He's got his campfire <laughs> going back there in the back of the room. Uh, but but uh, we're, so Michael's gonna be here. It's gonna be a great time. We have 75 people in the, uh, in the auditorium here. That sold out like before anybody could blink, so that's why maybe you didn't see any tickets available because it went so fast, it was gone. Well, it actually went it. out to our ambassadors yes, and, exactly. and executive producers. First, yeah, very quickly, yeah, and even some of them didn't get in on it because it was just oh, many gone. of them didn't yeah. get in, yeah. Yeah. but was, but you can watch it online yes. and it's going to be all uh, live. So we haven't done a live Passover in a very long time. It's, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Yep, exactly. And there, there's a, a few big announcements that are going to be. So you definitely need to tune in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back to oh, speaking, well, we want to talk about this though first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, your friend Rodney Thompson, he is the one doing the love gift this month. And he is doing something really special with uh, folks in India and Pakistan. Yeah, really. Just in the Middle East. Through, and the Middle East, yeah. So mm -hmm. what, can you tell us a little bit about what he's well, doing? Well, um, he's, he's actually helping out. Um, there's, you know, because of the different pedigrees in the social... You well, know, the caste system. The caste India. system, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they're, the younger ladies are sold into sex slavery. And so there's, he's connecting with people there to to help these women, to get them out. To buy them and out. To buy them out, basically, yeah. you know, so. Uh, to buy their freedom. And, and yeah. so what he's doing now, he's building that infrastructure. Uh, there's a couple of churches that he's working with, mm -hmm. you know, and ministering to. He'll go online and teach, you know, at those uh, gatherings. And um, yeah, man, it, the, the father's really put it on his heart to do it. And you know, it's really difficult because a lot in, in not that all of them, but you know, in like Africa, India and Pakistan, those places, there's a lot of scammers, you know, mm -hmm. so they'll hit you up on Facebook, you know, that are uh, ministers or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, he's been able to sift through that and find some really wow. good mm -hmm. ministries to work with. Yeah, I find that too, just because we're on Shabbat Night Live. And I don't know if you, every every Friday night after Shabbat Night Live, people, mm -hmm. I see people coming on and inviting me to be their friend on sure. Facebook. And it, some of it is, yeah, yeah, you're looking at the going out. Yeah, so. exactly. And you know exactly what that's all about. It's yeah. the, the scam that's going on, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, but he is also building infrastructure in terms of a building. And he's actually, mm -hmm. once you get these girls free, well then what? How do we make sure they don't get yeah. bought back into yeah, that? Exactly. And you've got to have basically a safe house. Mm -hmm. So if you get the love gift, you'll see how you can help Rodney Absolutely. get a safe house together for these girls. Mm -hmm. uh, and the information. He's taking it to the next level. He's yep. not yeah. stopping at their freedom. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. And yeah. that's why on we, to their education. That's why we put it on a DVD and a Blu-ray. We didn't put it on YouTube where somebody could take it down and right. whatever. No, you, we want you to be able to support yes. him. So that's yeah. why it's on here. You'll see it. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to talk next week as well because the month isn't we done are. yet and Passover is still coming. So, That's okay. Right. But for now, Bruce Brill reveals the shameful truth that members of the American intelligence agencies knew what was happening, yet deliberately misled the Israeli government right before the Yom Kippur War. The first episode of Israel and the Deep State is up next. In Matthew's account of the Gospel, Yeshua says that we are the light of the world. But in some parts of the world, the darkness we are to expose is more intense than we can imagine. Making the gospel relative, I don't believe, is conducive to making disciples. We're not supposed to be relative. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be the answer to a lost and dying world. Sharing experiences about his work to bring the Torah to Native American people here at home and to enslaved young women in the darkest reaches of India and Pakistan. Rodney Thompson brings a wake-up call to apathetic believers in Dealing with Darkness. Dealing with Darkness is our gift to thank you for supporting A Root Awakening International. When you donate $50 to this ministry in March, we'll send you Dealing with Darkness on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you Dealing with Darkness plus an olive wood mezuzah from Israel, featuring the Shema in Hebrew and English, inscribed both on the wood and written on a scroll inside. Donate $300 and we'll send you three gifts. Dealing with darkness, the olive wood Shema mezuzah, plus a 10-inch decorative butterfly bowl 
featuring vibrant, hand-painted artwork by artists in Israel. These gifts are a limited-time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Get these exclusive thank you gifts when you make a donation to support A Rood Awakening International in March. Call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. Folks around these parts tell me you're pretty quick with that shofar. I am. And that's a, a mighty purdy holster you got there. You sure you can uh, <clears throat> make me one? I am. <laughs> dude, why do you keep saying I am? It's the name of God, dude. Yeah, you know, I am. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> There's only one problem with that, partner. You see, this Sabbath gathering ain't big enough for two shofar. Are you saying we should draw? I am. Man. When Yeshua fed the 5,000 with 11 barley loaves in the Galilee, the Pharisees came down on him because they accused him that he and his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate bread. They did not wash their hands with a negel vesser and say this prayer, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us concerning the washing of hands. Why didn't Yeshua do that? Why didn't his disciples follow that? Because it is takanot. It is a law which they invented, and Moses said no one is ever allowed to add to or subtract from. But the night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took bread, and he put in place a rehearsal that was really put in place by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek himself brought forth bread and wine to Abraham, and Yeshua interpreted that very thing. Barukata Yelva Elahino Melech Alam, Hamotzi Lechem Miharetz. This is what Yeshua put in place, that before we eat bread, that we say this prayer. And as often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of him because his broken body was broken for us and by his stripes, we were healed. So as often as we do this, as often we do it in remembrance of him. And Yeshua took the cup and he said, Barukata Yehovah Elohim Malachalam, Bere pre hagafen. The creator of the fruit of the vine, Yehovah created the fruit of the vine. He said, This represents the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this. Remember me. And remember, I will be drinking this with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Shabbat Shalom. These days we hear a lot about misinformation or as Stalin would put it, disinformation. Well, it's not a new thing. Uh, there's been misinformation and disinformation for a long time, specifically when it relates to Israel. 1973, the Yom Kippur War. There were some things going on there that are not quite what we understand. There have been 
1,300 books written on this subject, and not one has mentioned what really went on. But there is a new book by Bruce Brill called An Ally's Deceit, and that author joins us today. Bruce Brill, welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Thank you, thanks for having me. Now, Bruce, you are coming to us from Israel, and uh, I understand that uh, you and Michael Rood go way back. Your name is uh, on our calendar that we put out every year. Uh, you're, there's a connection here between you and Nehemia and Michael, so tell us how this all started. I understand it started with something called Harari's Harp Shop. It actually started because I was running the folk music club in Jerusalem, which I started when I first came to Israel in 74, 75. I began a folk music club at um, a cultural center called Safta. And I kept running that for quite a while, and then eventually we transferred venue to the AACI, which is the Association of Americans and Canadians in Israel, AACI. And to promote the folk club, I would make flyers and go around Jerusalem and put them up wherever it was legal to put them up. <laughs> And one of the legal places was Harari's um, harp shop. Now, I had been citing new moons for several years. And I began citing new moons because of a group of people, non-Jews, that were living in Israel and were living biblically. They looked like escapees from a movie of the biblical period. They dressed in long white gowns that were linen and they tried to live their life according to Torah. And eventually they began living in a cave in the Wadi of Tekoa. And they asked me, Bruce, how come you Jews celebrate your holidays on these certain days that are on our calendar. And I, in my wisdom, began explaining to them that um, both the Christian calendar, the Western calendar, and the Muslim calendar are deficient. The Western calendar is a solar calendar. The Islamic calendar, the Muslim calendar, is a lunar calendar. The Hebrew calendar is both solar and lunar. And I was explaining, you know, the sophistication of the, what I call the Jewish calendar. And they said, that's all well and good, but come out with us and look for the new moon the next time there's supposed to be a new moon according to the rabbinic calendar. Now you notice at first I said the Jewish calendar. And now I said the rabbinic calendar. They're different because the Jewish calendar goes by cited new moons. And the Aviv barley sightings. And the rabbinic calendar, in their wisdom, the rabbis established a calendar back in the fourth century under Hillel II to set dates. And you will notice that on that rabbinic calendar, there are two days for each Jewish holiday. Two days if you are in diaspora, in the exile. Why two days? Because they weren't sure which was the correct day. So to be sure, they established two days, they fixed two days. Now, Robert Wadsworth came out with a astronomically correct biblical calendar. And Michael Rood had this calendar in his hand. And I had been sighting new moons for several years. And I saw that these Wadi folk, I called them the Wadi folk because they lived in the Wadi, 
for lack of a better name, they took me out and I became convinced that the rabbinic calendar is off one day or two days, sometimes two days, meaning that the calendar that fixed two days for holidays in diaspora, both days, half of the time, both days were incorrect. And the Wadi folk enlightened me. They opened my eyes to this problem. And so Michael said, I have a biblical calendar. And I said, I'm not interested in your calendar because I n- noticed that the rabbinic calendar was wrong. So I said, I'm not n- interested in your biblical calendar because this year, I think it was Rosh Hashanah, the uh, yeah. Yom Teruah, the uh, feast of blowing the shofar. The first day was incorrect and the second day was incorrect. And Michael opened his calendar and he said, the new moon appeared on the third day. And he said, at so many degrees above the horizon and with a uh, life ex- uh, expectancy of whatever it was, 20 some odd minutes or 15 some odd minutes. And I said, let me see that calendar. And we hit it off and we became close friends. You know, Michael's in, the stu- Michael's in the studio here today, Bruce, and he relayed that very same story. You couldn't even hear that on, on the mic uh, before we turned on the cameras here, but he told that story exactly as you just did. Wow. Now tell right. me how this, now this led to meeting Nehemia Gordon too. Take us through that. Okay, so I knew Michael from that moment and we hit it off as friends and I tried to help him as much as I could with his uh, ministry. It was a fledgling ministry at that time. You know, I don't even know what year it was. It was sometime in the mid 90s. And I, I want to tell you something about Michael. He really put out his whole heart and soul into uh, promoting his ministry. There was once, I don't know if he remembers this, there was once where we drove up to Haifa and he had something to do to check out some caves or something and meet someone. And I drove back home and he slept on a park bench that night to save money for a hotel. I mean, there's a, a true faithful pioneer. Okay, now getting back to uh, Nehemia Gordon. Now before you say that, just before, Michael is in the studio and he heard you say that, he says, I was sleeping on a cardboard box, on a piece of cardboard on that park bench. <laughs> <laughs> on a cardboard box. Fabulous. But, it, <laughs> but whatever it was, it wasn't a, a, a $90 hotel room. No, not a five-star hotel room by any stretch. Anyway, sorry, you were mentioning the Hemia. Please, go ahead. Okay, so I was so impressed with um, the new moon and our holidays being celebrated on the wrong day very often. So I wrote an article that was published in the Jewish Spectator. And because it was published in the Jewish Spectator, I was invited by the head of the New Moon Society, Roy Hoffman, to uh, attend one of his uh, lectures and uh, conventions. And it was then that uh, all three of us were put in touch. He gave me Nehemia's contact information and he says, shh, don't tell anybody because he could get in trouble. He's in the Orthodox world and to be in touch with a Karite, oh my God, to be in touch with a Karite is like a a criminal offense. 
I, mean, I suffered because I had connections with Karaites. I used to give talks at the OU Center, the Union of Orthodox Rabbis. And then at one point, after I began studying with Nehemia Gordon and associating with Michael already for a couple of years, I was straight armed from the OU. And I asked the head, what's going on? Why are you not giving me the common venues that you always gave me? And he said, uh, he hemmed and hawed, and I said, is it because I associate with non-Jews? And he said, no, that's not the problem. It was because I associated with Karaites. And so I, I went to the Karite headquarters uh, down in the uh, northern Negev, and I went there and I asked them, could you give me a statement that I'm not a Karite? And they did. They typed up a letter, an, a formal official letter that Bruce Brill is not a Karite. <laughs> and I went back to the OU with the letter. Here, this shows that I'm not a Karite. And the, the head of the OU looked at it and he saw the letterhead and he saw it was official. And he says, this proves that you are a Karite. <laughs> <laughs> Phariseeism at its finest. <laughs> and I was de denied the OU venue to, to give talks anymore. And also, um, I had been, uh, I told you I, I ran a folk music club in Jerusalem, and I was also sent on, uh, like, uh, embassy work as a musician to different Jewish communities. And I was sent to Serbia and Croatia and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia at the, at the time when it was still, and, and to the United States, to uh, Virginia and different places, Montana, particularly Montana. I had like six or seven venues through an organization that was called Soul Train. It was from the Jewish agency. And they found out that I had affiliation with the Karaites. And they said, I can't, I can't send you anymore on uh, these um, music tours. How can I send you to rabbinic synagogues if you associate with Karaites? I mean, they so despise the Karaites. And so you introduced Michael and Nehemiah. How did that happen? I understand it was uh, this, this Roy fellow first and then, and then Nehemiah, is that right? Right, I, you know what, I don't even remember. I think Michael was with me at this uh, convention and it was there that uh, Roy wrote down Nehemiah's telephone number for me to contact him. And Nehemiah anyway wanted to contact me because he saw my article in the Jewish Spectator. Ah, okay, very good. And today, uh, Nehemiah is a very big part of what uh, we do at A Rude Awakening International. Of course, Nehemiah has his own thing going on, but uh, we collaborate quite often and uh, we love him, our, our folks love him, and uh, we just really appreciate all he does now. He's Dr. Nehemiah Gordon now, you know. Right, we, we, miss, we miss him here in Israel. Yeah. Well, apparently he's going to be spending more time there, so we'll be able to spend more time with him. Now, uh, now, Bruce, you, uh, we only got five minutes left in this segment. We're going to come back and more, uh, more and talk about this. But, uh, but first of all, uh, so you have a history with uh, the United States government and military. Uh, can you take us briefly through how that all started? Within five minutes. Well, we're, we're going to continue. Just give us the, the, the introduction. How about that? <laughs> Well, uh, we were speaking about age before, and I'm 75 now. And back in 1970, 71, the Vietnam War was in full swing. And 
it was not a popular war. And the American government was looking for warm bodies to send over to Vietnam to fight because people were not volunteering to fight in Vietnam. It was not a popular war. And in 1970, they instituted the laugh, the draft lottery. And <laughs> my luck, I got number 51, November 7th, my birthday, lottery number 51. I knew I was going to be pulled off <laughs> to the army. Either, either that or, you know, you could run away. My dad, who fought in World War II, as a Jew fighting in Europe against the Germans, uh, he did not like the Vietnam War. He said, I'll pay your train fare if you want to go to Canada. And I'll send you a check. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But what I did do was you take a battery of tests and then you see if you can guarantee a job in the army that will keep you out of the jungles of Vietnam. And that, that's what I did. And I aced the army language aptitude test. They gave me language of my choice. What would you like? Cambodian, Laotian, Vietnamese, Chinese, or Arabic? I said, I think Arabic is the furthest away from Vietnam. Thank you. I'll I'll take Arabic. <laughs> so you learned you learned Arabic, and we're gonna we're gonna come back more and talk about this because that's just the, the precursor to this story. We're gonna come back and, and talk about this more. So Bruce, thank you for joining us uh, from Israel, and mm -hmm. uh, we are going to uh, talk more with Bruce. And uh, this is all possible because of your support. Thank you for supporting A Rude Awakening International. Uh, this makes Shabbat Night Live possible, and the information you're about to hear is gonna make it all worthwhile. So again, thank you for supporting to. Uh, or for your support to, to make Shabbat Night Live happen, and your support now can help others see this in the future. So thank you in advance. We'll be right back.
Thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live. Before the break, we were talking with Bruce Brill, good friend of Michael Rood, and uh, a fan of the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar, the calendar with the longest name in the history of the universe. And now we're going to speak to, go back to speak to Bruce. Bruce, just before the break, you were telling us how uh, coming into the army, they give you your choice of language and of all of the languages that were associated with Vietnam, uh, you chose one that was a little bit out of the box. Arabic, that was uh, an option. So uh, why did you choose Arabic? Well, because it was the furthest away from Vietnam, number one. Also, at the time, I was going for a master's degree in linguistics at Stony Brook University. It's a New York State University. And they said that it was very important to uh, major in uh, language that was in a different family group than the languages that I had some familiarity with, which was namely English, German, and Spanish. So Arabic foot the bill. And I wanted Hebrew, because that also would have foot the bill. And since I was Jewish and I knew the letters from when I went to Hebrew school, which, by the way, for most American Jews that are not orthodox, it's basically a what I call a bar mitzvah factory. They teach you how to read the letters, and then you read nonsense syllables. And that, that's what you do on your bar mitzvah. You recite Hebrew, but you don't understand what you're reciting. So nonsense syllables, but you perform. So I thought Hebrew would be my first choice, but they didn't offer it at that time. So Arabic is like a first cousin to Hebrew. And again, there was no need for Arabic linguists in the jungles of Vietnam. So it was a 47 week course at what was called Dillywick, Defense Language Institute, West Coast. If you ever spend any time in the US Army, or as Michael did in the Marines, half of the language is acronyms. And same thing with D Dillywick, was Defense Language Institute, West Coast. But it doesn't exist anymore. In fact, I did some history for the book that I wrote about the um, army service and the Vietnam War. And I learned that Dillywick only existed about a decade. Hmm. So from Dillywick and Arabic and Vietnam, we uh, have this connection to the Yom Kippur War. So. How did, what happened here between 1970, 71, and 73 when all of this was happening? What, what was the transition here? What led you to that? Okay, so the Arabic language course was a 47-week course at the time. And afterwards, you have um, security training in Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. And then afterwards, then you're sent to wherever Uncle Sam needs you. And I was sent to NSA, which at the time we would joke and say NSA means no such agency. Because at that time, very few people knew about the National Security Agency, NSA. Today, everyone knows about it thanks to Edward Snowden. But back then, they kept a very low profile and they did a good job because they were much bigger than the CIA that everyone knew about, but they kept a low profile. In fact, if we were asked, where do you work? We, would, we were told to just give a nebulous answer. And what do you do? You couldn't say that I'm a Hebrew linguist or an Arabic linguist at the same time that you said that you worked at NSA. 
You couldn't say them together. So they were very good at keeping a low profile. So I was working at NSA for the rest of my tour of duty. And my job there was extremely boring. And I used to joke, the reason that it's top secret is because they don't want anyone to discover how mundane and boring your work is. <laughs> so I began learning Hebrew, really learning Hebrew. And Hebrew is a piece of cake compared to Arabic. Arabic is much more complicated. Hmm. And I began learning Hebrew and it came time in 1973, at the beginning of 1973 in February, there was a lot of military movement of the Arabs, particularly Egypt and Syria near the borders of Israel. But we knew that this was just maneuvers. It was training, exercises. It wasn't staging for war. Same thing happened in May. You get a little bit nervous and you watch more carefully and you see that it's nothing. But in October, it was a totally different story. We knew in, we called it GS6, that's the department that dealt with the Middle East. We knew days in advance, we knew with certainty, and we knew on what day the Arab surprise invasion of Israel was going to happen. We knew this. However, on the first day of the war, I'm one of the few people who could gist Arabic and Hebrew. So they had me listening to live communication from the battlefront. And my job was to determine what communications had military value. And then I would press the record button and record any of these. I pick up an Israeli soldier on the Barlev line. This is a string of fortifications, Israeli fortifications along the Suez Canal that was called the Barlev line after General Barlev. Chaim Barlev, who became a friend of mine, by the way. In that communication that I'm listening to, and you can hear the sound of artillery and bombs going off, he calls his mother to tell his mother that they're under a surprise attack and not to worry, for the time being, they're holding their own. Please call my girlfriend and tell her that I'm okay. Take the car to the gas station, fill it up with gas, because war is happening. And at that moment, I understood that he and his buddies had no idea, they were totally surprised. And I said, oh my God, am I wearing the wrong uniform? And I promised myself that I would go to Israel after I got out of the army. Because somehow we had the intelligence and we didn't get it to our friends something wasn't right. And it, it moved me to become an instant Zionist. So it wasn't just, so there was not, no information passed along when you had it. 
I understand there was information passed along that was also false? Okay, this I had no idea. At the time, all I knew is that somehow we didn't get the information to our allies, the Israelis, or didn't get the information to them in time. I was always giving the benefit of the doubt until five years ago when I was invited to visit General Eli Zaira. He was the head of Israeli military intelligence at the time. He's still alive today at 95 years old. <clears throat> at the visit to Eli Zaira, he confided in me that he received an intelligence assessment from his American friends on the eve of the war. Don't worry, the Arabs have no intention of attacking. When I heard this, I quickly went home and I wrote an article to present to the Hebrew newspaper. And I went to Haaretz and the editor in charge of military affairs, he says, what you're saying is earth shaking. Did you record him? And I said, no. He said, did you have a witness with you? I said, no. He gave me back my article. He said, nobody will believe you. Now, I wrote this book talking about that because people were telling me, Bruce, you have to write a book because it's unbelievable. Because I'm sitting across the kitchen table from the head of Israeli military intelligence at the time. I said, you didn't know, but I wasn't even a sergeant. I was a specialist fourth class. I knew, and you didn't know. How, how is this possible? So I wrote a manuscript for the book after um, meeting with Eli Zahira, like three years ago, I began writing, actually putting pen to paper. And um, how can I say this? Um, it became clear that something very dirty happened. And I sent the manuscript to the Pentagon to have them review it. It was like walking into a lion's den, like Daniel walking into the lion's den. That's how I felt. But I felt I have to do this so that if there's anything classified in my manuscript that they would advise me to take it out. And as with speaking, I'm thumbing through here, I'm showing you some of the redactions that they made me remove after they approved it with two conditions. One, that I redact what they require, and two, that I don't add one additional word of new content. But in June of 2021, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces Archives, released a protocol of Moshe Dayan from the 7th of October, a day after the war began, in which he said that 12 hours, 12 hours before 
the attacks began, he received intelligence assessments from the Americans that the Arabs were not going to attack. 12 hours completely confirming my unbelievable story. So I had to send this piece of information that I wanted to include in my book back to the Pentagon so that I wouldn't violate their requirement that I don't add one word of, it, of new content because that would disavow their approval. And I did. So this book, this book has been approved twice by the Pentagon. So that seems kind of, this is kind of blowing my mind. Why, why would, so this has to be all declassified, I'm assuming. Why would the Pentagon agree for, for you to write a book and, and put their stamp of approval on it that basically damns them for killing thousands of Israeli servicemen? I have no idea. That's baffled me. I was sure, I was sure that they were going to say, this book is forbidden. You cannot publish this. But there were just certain sections, like what I disclosed to you about the uh, uh, Israeli that I heard. That's what I wrote, and they made that, for example, is one thing that they made me take out. So it, it can't be published. Sharing it with you, but it can't be published. Um, and it blew my mind. How can they let this book go out? But they did. So what, what do you make of that? I mean, this is, I mean, were you as dumbfounded as I am right now hearing this for the first time? Yes, but it's it's hopeful. It's a hopeful sign. Why? Because it wasn't people that hear my story, say, wow, America really screwed Israel. I say, no, it wasn't America. It was certain cells within the intelligence community. It wasn't America. I love America. Oh, the same OU that forbid me giving uh, speak, speak or talks uh, because of my association with Karaites, um, I went to them again with, with my book and with the reviews and so forth, and they said, um, sorry, Bruce, uh, we can't uh, give you a venue because you are attacking the United States. I said, I'm not attacking the United States. <laughs> You didn't read my book. You obviously didn't read the reviews of my book either. You obviously didn't notice that the Pentagon even approved publication of the book. So it's, it's very interesting that people jump to that conclusion that it's America that screwed Israel and I'm attacking America. No. I love, I love America, by the way. And that's why I sent my book to the Pentagon, because I want to visit my homeland, and I don't want to be put in jail because I published something that uh, didn't have Pentagon approval, and it might be violating uh, some security law. So... So this had to be quite a, quite a feat for you. I mean, do you have second thoughts? We're going to get into more of this, by the way. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, but we're going to have another episode because I want to get into the nitty-gritty here with you. But, but in just the last couple of minutes here, I mean, at the time, you realize this. You're, you're 70. You're 75 now. So at 72-ish, you're writing a book? Are you beginning to think to yourself, this is nuts. Why am I doing this? Look, when my dad was my age, he was hospitalized and he never got out of the hospital. He was actually 74 when he went into the hospital and he never came out. So I thought to myself, if, if they're going to knock me off, if someone's going to knock me off, 
that would be a better way of going than being horizontal in a hospital for five years like my dad. And so I said, I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to write a book. Everybody that read my manuscript said, Bruce, aren't you afraid for your life? And as a matter of fact, I opened the book by talking about my visit with General Rachavam Zaevi, who said, back in the 90s, when Jonathan Pollard was in jail, you know, Jonathan Pollard, the spy, and it seemed that my story that we didn't get intelligence to our allies, the Israelis, in time. That's what I thought back in the 90s. Um, could help Jonathan Pollard's case. So I wrote an article that we in American intelligence knew in advance, but somehow we didn't get the information to the Israelis in time. That's what I thought giving the benefit of the doubt in my naivety. And so Rachavam Zaevi, he asked me, what do you hope to gain by publishing this? And I said, I think it could help Jonathan Pollard. And he said, I don't know if it could help Jonathan Pollard or it might hinder his case. But one thing I do know is that you're putting your life in jeopardy. Wow. Well, let's hold, up, hold that thought. We're going to come back next week. We're going to come back next week because uh, I'm sure everyone watching this wants to hear what is in this book because you held it up. It's not some 20-page pamphlet. There's a lot yeah. to be said here. There you go. <laughs> so we need to dive in deeper. Uh, the Seat of an Ally by Bruce Brill. Bruce, thank you for joining us today on Shabbat Night Live. We're going to come back next week, talk more. So uh, you join us too, okay? Thank you for joining us for Shabbat Night Live. Until then, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon. And I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.